My name is Alex Hammond. As a member of the American Society since my retirement from the WSU Department of English in 2009, it is my great pleasure to introduce my long-term colleague from that department, Professor Nicholas Kiesling, as the 2021 recipient of the Society's Legacy of Excellence Award. This award recognizes the accomplishments in retirement of an internationally recognized scholar of medieval and early modern literature and culture. For brevity, let me list only a few highlights of Nick's academic labor since his retirement in the year 2000. His scholarship has shed new light on Anthony Wood, the 17th century antiquarian who made Oxford the best documented city in England before 1695. Nick's 2002, The Library of Anthony Wood, a massive descriptive catalog of 6,758 items, won praise as the first study to recognize the library's, quote, immense potential for better understanding of 17th century intellectual and popular culture. While Nick's 2009 annotated edition of Wood's autobiographies filled out gaps in the knowledge of his long life. And most recently, Nick's prize-winning research has opened new perspectives on books printed surreptitiously by Catholics in England before 1800. Nick's talk today focuses on what many see as the most significant achievement of his career, his scholarship on Robert Burton, fellow of Oxford College, Christchurch College librarian, and writer famous for his encyclopedic, The Anatomy of Melancholy. Nick's talk details the genesis, collaborative scholarly process, and groundbreaking computer-assisted editing that yielded from 1989 to 1994, the Washington State University and Oxford University Press's multi-volume edition of Burton's half million word magnum opus. Gordon Kipling of UCLA Center for Medieval Renaissance Studies describes the anatomy as, quote, a text of monumental importance to the early modern civilization in Europe, claiming that Nick and his collaborators produced the long awaited definitive edition of that text. In closing, I would observe the Nick's talk and career remind us of the vital importance to understanding human cultures of academic access to the historical record a record that library archives and librarians are essential to preserving and scholars like Nick essential to demystifying. I thank the Emeritus Society for naming me as the recipient of the Emeritus Society Legacy of Excellence Award for 2021. It's an honor which I will cherish. My talk today will concern my research done mainly in the 80s and 90s and tries to tell what a person in the humanities, specifically in English, does outside the classroom. I arrived in the English department at WSU in 1967. And in my first 10 years at WSU, there were tensions between the two factions, those who believed a job at the university involved only teaching versus those who believed a job at the university involved both teaching and research. These tensions were effectively resolved under the leadership of the chair, John Elwood, who guided our way to becoming a respectable teaching and research department, which by the mid 1980s was rapidly moving towards being a major department in the United States, noted for both its teaching and its research product productivity. Such splits were not unique to the English department. In a university meeting shortly after I came, I remember a lively professor of political science, Paul Castleberry, who stated with despair that WSU was the largest junior college in the state. That was a shocker to me. But by 1980, the goal throughout the university was to become a major research institution. This was perfect for me and over the next decade, I had challenges and fun, both in and out of the classroom. My first, first research after that first decade concerned the early modern author, Robert Burton, and his seminal work on depression, the anatomy of melancholy. Burton had read virtually everything that had been written on melancholy since classical times, and his book of over 500,000 words is still consulted and discussed because it dealt with every imaginable aspect of depression. My major publications on Burton after that first decade at 
WSU were the result of luck, persistence, and finally working with brilliant colleagues and inspiring mentors. I'll give three examples. I had just finished the publication of a book in 1977, for which I was unable to find, for documentation of a number of references, a scholarly edition of The Anatomy of Melancholy. 48 editions appeared in the 19th century and a number more in the 20th century, but it was no secret that all were deeply flawed. Several scholars had promised a, a scholarly edition, but no one was able to begin the collation of the important texts, let alone finish the work. What was the problem? During the next summer in 1978, I spent some time at the Newberry Library in Chicago which held all six of the authoritative editions of the anatomy published between 1621 and 1651. These were called authoritative because Burton himself had made substantive changes in each of the five successive editions. These em emendations made by Burton were not the only problem. The typesetters, proofreaders, and printers of each edition, almost as a rule, altered punctuation and spelling to conform to their own house style. In addition, they made a few blunders in transcription on virtually every page. Comparing random pages from the first edition to the last, the sixth, I found that there were some 50 variants on each page that appeared in each edition from the first to the sixth. Thus, the number of changes from the first to the last could be around 300 per page. That number times the number of folio pages of about 600 would indicate a total of 180,000 variants in a complete text. Any scholarly edition would have to account for all of the significant or substantive variants in spellings and additions and deletions and Burton's own changes from edition to edition. No wonder an authoritative text never appeared. With luck, a number of matters came together in 1979. Papers at conferences indicated that an edition of the anatomy was highly desirable. At WSU, an aggressive IT program with excellent advisors was available. And our Department of English had a genius, Thomas Faulkner, at computer pro programming. The resources were there to begin work and Faulkner began immediately on a multi-year task to create programs to collate multiple editions. It would have been impossible to prepare a scholarly text at an earlier time in any location in the United States or in the UK because the resources did not exist. In comparison, the work on the annotation of the text, the search for Burton's thousands of sources was an easier task, but still, because of the multiplicity of references and the lack of an authoritative text, no one came close to identifying more than 30% of these sources. At this point, we had three people at WSU to work on the text, three American scholars from the universities in the US to prepare the commentary, and four advisors, ranging from the vice president of the Guggenheim Foundation to a permanent scholar at the Huntington Library. It is almost a given that unforeseen problems would occur. And the first gave us a shock when one of our team, Winfried Schleiner, working on the commentary in the Bodleian Library in Oxford, noticed that there was an older scholar seeking exa searching exactly the same sources. This led to a rather uncomfortable conversation. The older scholar said that he had been working on the commentary to the anatomy since the late 1950s, trying to complete a, later, a labor that a number of earlier scholars before him, now dead and buried, had attempted to do. All of us knew the proprietary nature of Oxford scholars. One would latch on to a significant person, title, or theme and spelled, spend a lifetime preparing a definitive work. No one would dare to interfere, and Oxford had scores of grand projects that were never finished. This coincidental meeting, however, turned out to be a very lucky break for us. Winfried called to tell me of the other researcher, and I immediately telephoned that person, who happened to be John Bambro. 
one of the pro vice chancellors of the University of Oxford and the principal of Lineker College. It turned out that he had not even begun to think about a scholarly text and that if he had such a text as we could provide, he could make better headway, headway in his source studies for the annotation of the text. Our telephone conversations led to flights to Oxford in April 1980, which gave me a break from painstaking searches in the Clark Library in Los Angeles and the Huntington Library in Pasadena for variants within specific editions using what is known as a Hinman collator. At Oxford, Tom Faulkner and I had meetings with Bamborough and the editor of the University Press. We made an agreement to join forces for possibly publication by the Oxford University Press. It also led to a readjustment of assignments to our American annotators, all of whom graciously agreed to resign or to give me the choice of, as one said, running them over or joining forces. Once the merger was accomplished, we learned that we had received a large multi-year grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities. This allowed the team of five persons in Pullman, along with six graduate student research assistants and two people in Oxford to begin intensive work together in 1980. It also cemented a commitment from the Oxford University Press to publish the edition. Most fortunately for me, having a principal of a college as a colleague led to a position as a permanent senior visiting member of his college, which opened virtually every door for me in Oxford. This was vital for my work, for there, there were unknown obstacles, the most important of which turned out to concern Burton's personal library of 1800 printed books, half of which Burton bequeathed to the Bodleian Library and half to Christchurch Library. These had to be looked at, though I did not think they would be important for the preparation of an edition of the anatomy. It was generally assumed that Burton had a photographic memory and had, a, had made very few marginal notes in his books. Nevertheless, I also thought it would be exciting to see the books in Christchurch Library, which were stored in an Archiva Superiora in an attic above the main reading room. It did not take long to discover that Burton had made thousands of annotations in his books. If these annotations were recorded, along with the details of the publications of the books, they would not only help with the preparation of the text, but greatly lighten the tax, ta task of John Bamborough, who was preparing the commentary. I'll show you just one picture of Burton's annotations. Uh, and this is rather typical. That's one page on a fly leaf. Uh, no, I'm not going to read it now. I couldn't. That was read by me 30 years ago. I began work on the Christchurch books immediately, and this led to a fortuitous, me fortuitous meetings with other scholars who on occasion used the Archiva Superiora for research on Henry Purcell's manuscripts of musical compositions, or to check items in the Burton books themselves. On one occasion, a gruff Bodleian Special Collections librarian, Paul Morgan, came in. He knew who I was. Word gets around fast if there's an American with access to a rather privileged library. And after a period of silence, I asked him if he had enjoyed reading Burton. He answered, yes, yes, I read a page every day. In the loo, in the loo. I didn't ask what he did with the pages after he finished it. On another occasion, a Purcell scholar was doing his research among the manuscripts when a third person came in to, to consult an earlier edition of the anatomy. I was at the time puzzling over a scribble in one of the Burton books and thought it might be a good idea to ask that person if he knew, uh, if he recognized the hand. He was rather standoffish and said he knew nothing about Burton's hand. Hmm. After he left, the Purcell scholar asked if I knew who that was. No, I answered. And he told me it was Lord Dacre. Lord Dacre was the renowned historian Hugh Trevor Roper, who was, in 1982, 
being attacked for making errors in the identification of manuscript hand, which he had once claimed were written by Adolf Hitler. Things then became very clear, at least to me, for I was probably correct in assuming that Trevor Roper figured that an upstart Mer American was baiting him by asking his opinion on a manuscript hand. When I came close to finishing the examination of the 800 books in the Christchurch Library, I turned to the 900 that were in the Bodleian Library. I had a stroke of luck when I learned that the head of special collections in the Bodleian Library, David Rogers, had some time ago, long ago gone through the early modern books in the library looking for Burton books. They were scattered in the stacks on the J floor of the new Bodleian Library. When I met him, he gave me his materials because he knew he could ne never finish the task. And more importantly, supported work, supported me to, when I applied for work in the stacks of the new Bodleian Library, a privilege today, which is not given to any reader. I averaged two visits a year to Oxford from 1980 to the publication of the Library of Robert Burton in 1988. The many scores of references to this work in the three volumes of the annotations shows how important the library of Bert Robert Burton was to their research. Another fortuitous possibility that came my way uh, when I spoke to the Bodley's, Bodley's librarian about a possible exhibition in 1990 at the library to celebrate the 350th anniversary of the death of Burton. I told him that I had discovered a missing half of a Burton letter in Gloucestershire County Records Library, and it could be part of the exhibition catalog. I'll just show you the fragment of the letter that was buried in a stack of about 100 folio pages. He agreed. And I prepared a 123 page catalog for the opening of the exhibition in January 1990. The catalog was beautifully designed and printed by the Bodleian Library. And here is a photograph of the front cover. That is an image of Burton as, he, as it is on his grave in Christ Church Cathedral. And here is the Burton family coat of arms. Oxford University Press published the first volume of the anatomy in 1989. And five years later, in 1994, the third and final volume. Six years after that, in 2000, the third and final volume of the commentary was published and the whole press hosted a party in January 2001 to celebrate its completion. The reviews of all our publications were as good as they could be, but because we had waived all royalties, Tom Faulkner and I had to be satisfied with our salary increases in the Department of English, which supplied more than enough money for us to be able to buy beer at Rico's. Here at Washington State, the benefits of the research of the anatomy were many. Our grants <clears throat> supported six research assistants in the 1980s. And we invited distinguished scholars from the US and UK to give lectures. These included John Bambro, <coughs> <coughs> the principal of Lineker College, Oxford, who gave a lecture in October 19, 1983 in the Fine Arts Auditorium and was fated by President Glenn Terrell. Henry Woodhausen, president of the Oxford Bibliographical Society and rector of Eng Lincoln College, Oxford, who came in January 1986. Julian Roberts, the keeper of printed books at the Bodleian, who came in April 1991. David Vasey, <clears throat> Bodley's librarian, for whom President Smith and Vic Badia held a reception at the Alumni Center, who came in April 1992. <clears throat> and Richard Check, a premier early modern scholar who spent most of his career at Notre Dame, who reviewed our project 
and lectured on the anatomy. In sum, our work on Burton was good for us, for Washington State University, for Oxford University, and for Oxford University Press, and for readers of the anatomy of melancholy, <clears throat> a Renaissance treatise on depression. To those who suffer from me melancholy, Burton gives his own cure. I write of melancholy by being busy to avoid melancholy. There is no greater cause of melancholy than idleness, no better cure than busyness. And to be busied in toys is to no small purpose, yet better do to no end than nothing. I write therefore and busied myself in this playing labor. Thank you.